evidence. And yet, I'd say 5,500 manuscripts in Greek is a lot of evidence. So, we also have some other manuscripts that come early, as many as a dozen from the second century. And then we go all the way through the, the uh, 10th century, A.D. 1,900 years after the New Testament is completed, we have at least 967 Greek New Testament man manuscripts written in the first millennium. Now, what if you were to compare that with the average classical author? Within 900 years of the New Testament's completion, almost 1,000 manuscripts, as we just saw, within 900 years of the average classical author's writings, there are zero manuscripts. You saw that for some of these better-known authors, 1,200 years, 1,500 years, we're waiting a long time before we see any copies. So when someone says, well, gee, we don't have copies of the New Testament until maybe we have, we have to wait for copies of copies of copies. Well, let's multiply that uh, several dozen times, maybe a hundred times when you're talking about other ancient literature. Compared to anything else in the ancient world, the New Testament on average is about a thousand times more evidential. That is, we have about a thousand times more material evidence for the New Testament than we do the average classical author, and it comes as much as a thousand years earlier than the average classical author. That's an embarrassment of riches, and it is an embarrassment because we simply don't have enough scholars to work on this. Okay, so I said we're going to ask four questions. The first, last three questions will be quick. Has the Bible been translated and retranslated so many times that we don't know what it originally said? Of course not. We still can go back up that line and see a manuscript from the second century or third or fourth. We're not just dependent on that last person in the, the line of the telephone game where it's a game that's intentionally trying to garble it. We have several lines of transmission. It's not oral. It's written, and we can go back and check those lines of transmission much early and do the comparisons. If I were to read out uh, a long statement to all of you, that lasted maybe I read for five or ten minutes, and I asked each one of you to write out exactly what I wrote. I have a good feeling that I'd be able to reconstruct exactly what I said based on what you wrote. I would know which scribes did a better job. Some of you leave out whole sentences. Some of you have not what I said based on what you wrote. I would know which scribes did a better job. Some of you leave out whole sentences. Some of you have nonsense. Some of you have no clue how to spell. Uh, others um, are, are very, very painstakingly accurate. You'll miss something, but the scribe next to you will get it. We can reconstruct that from these variants, from these manuscripts. Another way to look at this is in 1611, the King James Bible came out, and the New Testament was essentially based on eight manuscripts. And of those eight, three were really heavily used. A hundred years earlier by the, the first published Greek New Testament done by a man named Erasmus. Three manuscripts. The oldest of these was 11th century, and he didn't trust that one very much because he thought it was more corrupt. He didn't know how old it was. He had no idea how to date it. Now, in 2018, we have 5,500 manuscripts plus, and our oldest go back to the second century. So as time goes on, we're actually getting closer and closer to the original text, not farther away. Okay, that's question number one. Number two. What kinds of textual variations are there? And I'll be much faster about the rest of these. But I wanted to talk to you about the variants and the manuscripts. It's such important evidence to think about. Well, I could break this down into several different categories, but I can simplify it this way. Over 99% make virtually no difference at all. For example, there are spelling differences in the manuscripts that really affect nothing. <laughs> you guys did not laugh at that. Where are you from? <laughs> John, or the author of the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, was a very creative speller. He spelled the same exact word three different ways within the space of eight verses. I don't know how he could have pulled that off, but my brother was a creative speller, is a creative speller. He one time wrote a check out to me and misspelled his own name. <laughs> I wonder if that was intentional because it's kind of hard to cash. But uh, anyway, these don't really affect anything. They can't even be translated. 
there are so many different kinds of things that don't get translated, difference in word order, uh, spelling differences, other things. And so I have a question for you Greek geeks. How many ways are there to say John loves Mary in ancient Greek? Well, let me give you some, some issues. Now, if you don't know Greek, you still need to write the answers down because this will show up on the exam tomorrow. There's word order differences. Greek can put it in any order at once. John loves Mary. Mary loves John. Loves Mary. John loves John. Mary. It doesn't matter because Greek is a highly inflected language. You tell what the subject is by the end. You tell what the direct object is by the ending. And the Greek definite article, the word the, occurs with proper names. We don't know exactly why. I wrote my master's thesis on when the article does not appear in Greek. I spent over 1,200 hours writing that thesis. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on when it does appear in Greek. These two works could cure the most hopeless insomniac. We have the article in the Greek New Testament is far more common than any other word. One out of seven words is the in Greek. And we still don't know why it's used with proper names, although there have been lots of theories. Nothing has compelled scholars to believe it uh, one way or another. So you can say, the John loves Mary, the John loves the Mary, John loves the Mary, and it's always translated, John loves Mary. Then there's differences in spelling. For example, the name in John, for John in Greek either has two N's in the middle or one N. Every time we see it, there are some manuscripts with two N's, some with one. Ioannes or Ioannes. Pronounce the same spelled differently. So how many ways are there to say John loves Mary in Greek? There's eight different ways. I had to obviously put this in Greek. If I put this in English, it would say John loves Mary each time, and so you wouldn't get a sense. So you need to, I, I'll, I'll give you a little time to write these down so you have, uh, have the data. It's not just this number of ways. There's another eight ways to say John loves Mary. Same word for loves each time, and it's always translated, John loves Mary. It's not Mary is loved by John. Every verse, every sentence, I mean, is translated, John loves Mary. And some more ways, and more. I can assure you these are all different. This took me eight hours one day to come up with this. So I hope you appreciate this. Yeah, I'm anal like Brother Andrew, I know. 96 ways to say John loves Mary in Greek without changing the basic meaning at all. But there's also conjunctions that are often untranslated that uh, go along with sentences like this. And I just picked on a few of them, and so there's some more ways to say John loves Mary. Hold on a second. <laughs> 384 ways to say John loves Mary in Greek without changing anything. Now, there's actually more ways, but after eight hours, I felt that I proved my point. <laughs> These are not all the ways to say John loves Mary in Greek. Other legitimate word orders swell the numbers to over 500, and a different verb for loves now mushrooms the numbers to nearly 1,200. Bart Ehrman said we could go on nearly forever talking about specific places in which the texts of the New Testament came to be changed, either accidentally or intentionally. The examples are not just in the hundreds, but in the thousands. He's absolutely right. And if we talked about these, that would cure the most hopeless insomniac. If we can say John loves Mary over 1,000 times in Greek without substantially changing the meaning, the number of textual variants for the New Testament is meaningless. It's a meaningless number. What counts is the nature of these variants. What really is affected? And the smallest category of variants are those that are both meaningful and viable. That is, they, they change the meaning to some degree, and they have a, a, a good chance of being authentic. That's what we mean by viable. Less than one-fifth of one percent of all textual variants fit this group. Here's a way to represent it. The big blue box is the number of textual variants we have. And when you hear about 500,000 textual variants, this is the way that most people think about it. But let's talk about the ones that are actually significant. It's that little yellow box in the corner. That's what we're really talking about. I am a member of the Society of Biblical Literature. Bart Ehrman is also a member of that, and he has given several lectures there. I've given lectures there as well. And when we have this group of textual scholars to get together and talk about variants, I can assure you we've never talked about 
this large blue box. We'd get kicked out of the society for doing something so boring. What we're focusing on are those that do change the meaning of the text to some degree. So let me give you a couple of illustrations. Here's one of my favorites, Mark chapter 9, verse 29. Jesus' disciples were trying to kick out some demons, cast out some demons, and they were unsuccessful. So he said to them, this kind can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. Or did he just say, by prayer, period? This is the only place in the entire New Testament where and fasting may be part of the original text in the sense of uh, it's a command or a suggestion that you need to fast to do something. So maybe if some of you are involved in exorcisms, you might want to hedge your bet and pray and fast, or you might just pray. Most scholars think uh, the original text ends with prayer. 